Okay. Well, good afternoon. My name is Henrik, and I'm here today to talk to you all about how one can create APIs beyond REST. So this talk is actually an experience talk about uh, a realization that the team I was working with had while we were developing some of the core applications in the new sales and ticketing system for Entur. Entur is a Norwegian firm that is building one single API and one single app for finding and buying trips with public transportation. They currently offer tickets uh, for, with buses, trams, boats, uh, and trains in most of Norway. And they're quickly rolling out more regions and more means of transport uh, as part of their service. So when building this system, we model it as a set of data modules and function modules. So we did not opt for a true microservice architecture, but we chose an architecture where each of the core business functions or business areas would be represented by their own module. A module could, for example, be a set of services like in a microservice architecture, but in most cases, each module got implemented as a single application. All the modules provide publicly exposed REST APIs for synchronous communication between modules or from external clients made by customers. So we can take a look at some modules in this system. So here we have some data modules. We have the payment module that stores all the information about payments, about payment transactions. We have the customer module that stores all the customer data. We have an order module that stores all customer orders, order states, and what each order contains. And we have the project module that uh, keeps track of all products and project versions uh, that are available for purchase. So each data module is the data owner, which means that they are the single source of truth when it comes to data validity and that there should not be any data replication across modules. And this is especially handy in, uh, when regarding GDPR, since all the customer data is located in one single module, deleting customer data is very easy to do. And here we have two examples of function modules. A function module is something that provides a business function or makes that business function easier to perform. So we have two good examples here. Order history combines data from different data modules into a complete history of all purchased travels by a customer. And the reserve module makes it easy for customer-facing applications to reserve a trip. And when a customer wants to obtain his or her order history, they ask the order history module to create it. Order history will then, uh, <laughs> will then gather all the data from each data module, uh, combine it, and return it to the end user as populated data. Each module is responsible for its own data, but it keeps references to other data as well. And the same thing is happening when a client wishes to reserve a trip. The reserve module will perform all necessary actions needed to make a reservation and then returns the finished order to the client. And these function modules exist to provide a business function and make it easier to use the API. So instead of having customer applications uh, performing three separate API calls just to reserve an order, the application will only need to do one. So we will also need to address one very important feature of each data module, and that is that we wish to keep them free of dependencies. And it was therefore decided to try and prevent having direct communication between each module. And that kind of makes sense, doesn't it? Because there's no reason for a data module to keep track of or use data from another module. Well, no. It doesn't make sense, actually. Because we're, we're dependent on letting information flow between the different modules. And I will give you some examples. The order module is absolutely dependent on knowing whether or not a payment has been completed. The order cannot be confirmed as sold before it knows if the order has been paid. So we absolutely need information to flow between the payment module 
and the order module. And the same thing is happening between the order module and the ticket module. We would absolutely not want to create and activate a ticket if the order in question has not been paid. So we would need that information about, or, or we would need that information about the order status to propagate from the order module to the ticket module. And to do so, we introduced Kafka to our system. So how many of you have heard about Kafka? Hands. Great. How many of you have actually used Kafka or are using it in production today? So that's maybe 10 people. <laughs> um, OK. So I will not go in depth and explain how the Kafka core works, but I will show you some of the benefits of Kafka. So Kafka is a distributed streaming platform and more. And it's really high performance, and it can process billions of messages per day. It's scalable and comes with built-in redundancy features, making it easy to use even for larger mission-critical applications. And a very important feature for us at N2, by using a streaming platform like Kafka, we created looser couplings between each data module. So we can do a short analysis of one of our data modules. Here we can see a handful of events that are a result of different operations on the payment module. So we have a payment created event, we have a transaction created event, transaction completed, payment completed, cancelled payment, and transaction refunded. And if we do, uh, or if the user creates a payment, then the result of that action would be a payment created event. And if we do an analysis like this on every data module, we would find a set of different events in every module. And it's these events that are important to make available to other modules in the system. So if we take a look at the payment completed event, we can see that when a payment has been completed in the payment module, we would like to append that event to the event log. So the payment module will push that, that fact or that event to the Kafka cluster with the ID of the payment and the ID of the order, etc. And the order module is listening for such events from the Kafka cluster. And by doing this, we let information flow from a module, and the other modules can choose to react to that event if they want to or if they need to. So we can also do another example. When the order module has read the payment completed event, it can react to that by changing the status of the order. But a change in the order status is information that the ticket module might be inter interested in knowing. So the ticket module is, in this example, listening for an order confirmed event, because it would like to react to that event by creating and enabling the ticket for this particular order. So the solution to the no direct communication restriction on uh, the data modules is to use a streaming platform like Kafka to provide asynchronous communication between all modules. And every module produces events to the Kafka cluster, and all applications listen for the events that they need to know about. And this actually provides us with some extra benefits. So let's say that the accounting department wants to start tracking every sale that's being made. They create their own application or module and because we're using a streaming platform, none of the existing modules will have to make any code changes because they are already publishing their facts to the stream. The only thing that the accounting application will have to do is to start listening for the right events, and then they're good to go. And one of the Kafka-specific benefits of this kind of architecture is that Kafka can keep all the events that has been published since the beginning of time. So when the accounting application starts to, uh, to listen for events, it can read all the sales that has been published to the stream since the beginning of time. And even if the accounting department were to, for some reason, lose their database, they could just start reading from the beginning of the stream. And they would be able to replay all the events 
and recreate their database from that stream. So REST versus Kafka. Why should you and how can you choose one or the other? Well, you shouldn't choose one. Synchronous versus asynchronous APIs doesn't really make sense because we can't just stop accepting synchronous requests. There still is a need for REST or gRCP or any form of synchronous API. But instead of putting these two types up against each other, we should combine them. And adding Kafka to a system opens a whole range of new possibilities that most likely will bring a lot of business value to your company or to your customers. Kafka will help you to evolve your APIs to another level, that, only cons uh, that APIs that only consist of request response functionality can't reach. So let us take a look at uh, a real life example. So, Antur, they are not servicing any lines. They don't drive any buses. They don't have any trains. But Antur provides one unified sales and ticketing system for everything. But they're not supposed to act as a monopoly. So anyone who wishes to start a traveling agency might do so and can start to use the Antur API to do it. And as of today, there are at least three different apps or websites that you can visit to buy tickets through the Antur API. So Antur, they have one themselves, and two of the operators have their own uh, customer-facing applications. But each operator might have different needs. So let me explain the Kafka Streams API. So we have three different apps that a customer can use to buy its tickets. One is made by Antur, the other two are made by the operators. And when the order with ID 123 is completed, we push an order confirmed event to the internal Kafka cluster. And then the receipt module will usually react to that event and send a receipt to the customer's email address. But one of the operators doesn't want us to send uh, receipts to the customer on behalf of them. They want to do it themselves. And that is an easy task for us. We just react to the order confirmed event as usual. But if the sales point on that or, uh, specific order is the, uh, the app from that specific operator, then we do nothing instead of sending the receipt. But this is where the fun part begins. Because we have also created a set of stream processing modules. And their task is to read one or more streams from the internal cluster, process the event, and publish them to an external cluster. So in this example, we will process all the order confirmed events and publish them to a stream on the external cluster sorted by sales client. So if a sale was processed with, through the app from operator number two, then we publish that sale to a stream specifically for that operator. And now the operator can react to that event however they please. They can now send the customer a receipt on their own. But Kafka have even more benefits. So Kafka has a query language called KSQL, which surprisingly is kind of like the SQL language. And I need to have a disclaimer here. Uh, we didn't really use this at the time that I left N2. So this here is a modified example from one of Ben Stopford's presentations on Kafka. So Ben Stopford, he works for Confluent, which is the company behind the, the Apache Kafka project. So here we have a query that looks for suspicious sales transactions. So we can see that we have the we read from the order confirmed stream, and then we create a, a new stream called suspicious sales. And we define that stream by selecting the customer ID and account. And we're using a window range of the last 10 minutes. So if any customer has purchased five or more tickets in the last 10 minutes, then an event will be published to the suspicious sales stream. So this right here is actually real-time fraud detection uh, built into the streaming platform. 
which I think is very impressive. So what, what are the benefits of using Kafka? Well, it's a distributed streaming platform. High availability, it is scalable, and it has built-in redundancy. It comes with a streams API, which makes it very easy to create stream processing applications, like the one I showed you. It also has its own query language, which makes it easy to read, process, and create streams without the need to write a single line of code. And it can store data indefinitely, just like a database, making it possible for new applications to read and process everything that has happened since the beginning of time, which is extremely powerful. So what should the key takeaways be from this talk? Well, evolve your APIs. The benefits from combining a request-response type of communication with a streaming platform like Kafka are huge. The event-driven model will provide your development teams and your customers with a whole range of new possibilities that most certainly will make your APIs more valuable. And that was it. Thank you so much for listening.